Good evening, everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Kara Circle. Kara Circle is the nonprofit programming arm of Kara's Books. And Kara's Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We are thrilled to be here tonight celebrating Southbound essays on identity, inheritance, and social change with Anjali Njeti and Anoa Changa. Um, this event is so special. We get to kick it off with you. Um, and, and you have two books coming out back to back. Um, from different presses, but you know this is the book that we have really been waiting for from you. You're somebody who has been um, a special part of our community for so long, and it's a real thrill when somebody that we know who has put in the work and done so much for other people gets to have her moment in the sun. So um, I hope that you are just basking in in the joy of this and really. Um, really just feeling how wonderful it is and how, how much joy we all feel for you um, on your publication day. So, um, you know, people are already saying congratulations in the chat. And I know many people across the internet have been um, celebrating you today. Um, so we, we hope to bring that spirit into, into, the, into the virtual house tonight. Um, so one of the ways that we wanted to celebrate was also by bringing in our community partners. And so, um, we asked Raksha to be here with us, and Raksha is in the chat. Raksha is an incredible community partner of ours that focuses on um, empowering um, South Asian community around all kinds of issues, but especially around um, preventing um, domestic violence and, um, and sexual assault and other forms of violence. And we're always honored when they are with us, um, and Aparna in particular, we're grateful for all that Aparna does. Um, and we are also here with um, the Georgia Muslim Voters Project, and Zanrea is here to tell us a little bit about the work that they are doing right now. So we've asked uh, Zan to speak first and, and, and kick us off, and then I'm going to come back and, and say a few words um, about our esteemed speakers tonight. So Zan, welcome to you. Hi, ER, and good evening, ladies, and all our um, guests in the chat room. My name is Zanrea Bilal. I'm representing the Georgia Muslim Voter Project. Um, and I'm not going to take up too much time because I want to get to this amazing, amazing book. So Georgia Muslim Voter Project, we were founded in 2015 in response to a lot of anti-Islamic, anti-Muslim rhetoric that was coming out of mainstream media platforms, as well as lower rates of civic engagement and voter participation among <laughs> Muslim communities in Georgia compared to other minority communities. So out of that, Georgia Muslim Voter Project was founded. And our mission is to empower first our community members by registering them to vote, um, and also to engage our in nonpartisan civic engagement information in order to inspire and inform to activity and to them for and community members to engage and make sure that we can solve common challenges within ourselves and within our unelected and elected leaders. So we focus on registra voter registration, civic engagement, and voter education among around more than just elections. We also focus on redistricting, census, and other um, issues that are near and dear to our community. And so with that, I will kick it off to our amazing lady. Thank you so much, Zan. So we'll be dropping links in the chat for further, <laughs> further reference as well. All right, so um, I want to tell you a little bit more about our panelists tonight, and I'm going to start with our interviewer. Anoa Changa is an independent journalist based in Atlanta. Anoa focuses on electoral justice, voting rights, and politics. She's an innovator of electoral justice as, as a reported beat. An organizer by nature and a retired attorney, Anoa has a strong sense of equity and justice. She has bylines in The Appeal, Essence, News One, Scalawag, Magazine, Dame Magazine, Huffington Post, and Rewire News. And I'll be dropping links to her work where you can follow more about her um, throughout this evening. So welcome, Manoa. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for providing the space. And then tonight, the person of the hour, Anjali Anjeti is an award-winning essayist who writes about books, politics, and social justice. She is the co-founder of the Georgia chapter of They See Blue, an organization for South Asian Democrats. Her work has appeared in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, Al Jazeera, Boston Globe, Washington Post, and other venues. 
Her, her collection of essays, Southbound, is available for purchase tonight via this teal link right here at the bottom of your screen. And her debut novel, The Parted Earth, comes out, uh, I think, May 4th, early May, first week of May. Um, it is also available for pre-order from Karis tonight. Um, she teaches creative writing in the MFA program at Reinhardt University and lives with her family near Atlanta, Georgia. So um, we have known you as somebody working tirelessly to make our communities better, stronger, safer, uh, more free. So um, it's wonderful to have these lessons and these stories in a book. So I'm gonna get out of the way and, and we're gonna get to enjoy all of these things. Thank you so much. Oh my God, we're doing this. Like this does not feel like work. Uh, when Anjali asked me, would I sit in conversation with her about her new book? I actually wasn't sure which book because this <laughs> dope mama has two books coming out or out and I've managed to get both and I can't wait, wait to dive into the first. This jammy right here, Southbound, my, my, my camera is rotated so it's backwards, but I hope y'all know, take pictures, Post the post to the page. Like if you are from Georgia, you know we post the peach when we vote. Post your southbound when you get it. Um, I am so honored. I am so so very honored and enthralled, y'all. I took a nap, okay, to be here and be fully present. You know how it is when you momming and doing all the things, and even a seven thirty conversation is like, oh, that's kind of late. But for Anjali, I would move heaven and earth and do anything. So sis, thank you so much for asking me to be here with you. And I, I'm going to kick it to you to, to introduce us and bring us to the book. But I just wanted to say a few words real quick about you and why this is so important that we're here having this conversation. It is a really heavy time we are in right now. Uh, we have been over a year in pandemic. We've been through an amazing ride of an election, an amazing, not necessarily because it was all good, but amazing just because it's an amazing sight to behold what was built. I mean, the work you did with They See Blue in Georgia and just as a part of a broader collective, I always remind folks through my reporting that it was a huge, amazing co collective coalition effort that happened here on the ground. Um, and just even, you know, tonight, you know, if anyone's from Chicago or the Midwest, you know, just what's been happening out there and, and this book, <laughs> what you wrote, before we got to this point, it's just, it's so timely to be sitting here having these conversations with you at such a critical point in our country, in our democracy, in our communities. And so I just wanna say thank you for sharing your voice. I wanna say thank you for being this bridge builder of experiences because, you know, we in a not too recent past had folks who say, oh, well, that's too niche or oh, that's something that only would fit a certain demographic. But you speak to a common experience. We may not have the same exact experiences, but you speak to a common language, a common experience, a common understanding that resonates with us all. So with that, I turn it over to our esteemed author, Anjali, to discuss or to read a few excerpts for us about Southbound essays, essays on Identity, Inheritance, and Social Change. So first of all, I want to thank everybody here. Um, I kind of feel like this is a family reunion for me, and everyone involved in helping to put this event together is family. They have raised me up. That includes Karis, um, one of the last feminist bookstores in the country, they are constantly holding events like this. They are constantly supporting social justice conversations and providing the space and the nurturing needed for them. Um, please donate if you can um, so that they can keep doing this work. The Georgia Muslim Voter Project, I'm so inspired about what they've been able to achieve in such a short period of time. Um, it has been a pleasure and an honor to get to know those folks and to understand the work they're doing. Um, and uh, they really played a big role in, um, in getting Georgia to where it is today. And Raksha has been around for decades and a big shout out to that organization. Um, they have been healing the South Asian community for decades. Um, Aparna has done an outstanding job as the executive director 
And in many ways, um, I feel like I'm here today because of the work that she modeled. Um, and everyone, Anoa is an outstanding journalist. Um, she covers um, politics and civil and human rights. And please, please, please get to know her work if you don't already know it. Um, so I'm going to read very quickly a few paragraphs from the beginning of Southbound just to give people an idea idea of what the book is about, um, and then we'll get started in the conversation. So this is from the prologue, kind of the prologue. It's at the very beginning, and the section is called, What Are You? Where Are You From? Questions about my identity have echoed in my mind for decades. They have been absorbed by the tympanic membranes of my eardrums and have traveled through the synapses of my brain. Shadows, they have followed me everywhere. My racial and ethnic identity is oftentimes a Rubik's cube to be solved. I am half Indian, a quarter Puerto Rican, and a quarter Austrian. I am an immigrant's daughter and also a daughter of the Deep South. Despite an ever increasingly diverse United States, I remain a perpetual foreigner. Violence, erasure, exoticism, appropriation, these forces can shape assumptions about identity. Beginning in 2014, when the plight of Syrians fleeing civil war blanketed the airwaves, a man working inside my home said, without prompting, that he could tell I was from Syria. When the United States denounces countries of the Southern Hemisphere, I am Venezuelan or Guatemalan or Mexican. Having ambiguously brown skin makes me an aberration, a visitor, or an intruder who can pose a threat to someone's safety, success, or security. My own identity began to form after the 1982 racialized killing of Vincent Chin in Detroit, and was later shaped through the hostility toward brown people during the Persian Gulf War and after 9-11. For years, my identity was a reactionary state of being. It has taken my me time, reflection, and a lot of hard work to develop a sense of identity that is defined by my own parameters, that derives from an, an authentic self-concept rather than a defensive posture born of stereotypes or suspicion. Of course, identity goes far beyond trauma, pain, othering, and exclusion. It is history, family, traditions, lore, and love. It is a celebration of the myriad ways in which we view and move throughout the world. But identity, when it derives from a place of injustice, can transform itself into collective socio-political power. An individual identity can lead to an external energy, one that brings awareness, agency, and community one that acknowledges complicity and by doing so gives rise to activism and social change. And that's a little bit of the book. And that's a little bit of the book. Like, wow. So when we were talking in preparation for this, we talked about how you wrote this, like this was already going into copy editing and print. Mm -hmm. When all the when pandemic, all this was starting, you know, you had already written this book and thinking about where you were when you first. Well, let me actually first start it. What made you sit down and write Southbound? You know, Southbound has been through so many variations. So at first, I just wanted to write something to sort of get out all the stories of racialized trauma that I sort of held really tightly inside. Um, but then when I took a look at it um, and started reading some sample essays and started doing the deeper work, which made, which helped me to see the ways that I had been complicit in the same force of white supremacy that I felt so injured by. And when I started, I mean, and that was that was hard to do. It was really hard to look at myself really critically and be like, 
look at the ways that you are also holding white supremacy, even though you have felt very injured by racism in your life. So that took, that was quite a process for me. I mean, I, I started writing different kinds of essays um, and I started doing the very deep work of investigating what was underneath that um, and, and how we can be forces who are both hurt and, and forces that do harm at the same time. Um, but then I started asking myself, what does one do with this trauma? What, what can it do? And then I started reflecting on the fact that we can take all this hurt and we can put it into something else. We can connect it with other people. We can connect it with communities. And we can do this healing work together by breaking down the power structures that harm all of us, people of all races, people of all ethnicities and faiths and abilities and gender and sexual identity, right? I mean, white supremacy is bad for everyone. It's dangerous even for white people. So, so I wanted then to shift the focus of the book into um, a, a, a work that really showed people, hey, if you're hurting and if you have the emotional and psychological energy to do so, there are activists, there are organizations where you can, that you can come to, there are safe spaces where you can actually do the work of dismantling what hurt you, dismantling what really changed your idea of yourself and caused you some damage. And writing it has really been a very healing process for me, um, even though it was hard, even though it really caused me to look at myself through a microscope and see the ways that I had, I had failed and that I had contributed to other people's harm. Um, and, and this is, this is the result of it. Um, and, and hopefully I'm hoping it will resonate with people. Yeah. And I appreciate that last part you touched on in terms of like, just really thinking about the ways in which our, even as we experience our own harm, I mean, we live within a system and a society that is toxic in many ways. And unfortunately we, we learn some of those behaviors and inflicted upon others. So thank you so much for, for just sharing that. So just thinking about some of the ways that you talk about the different of impacts of systems of power and also how in our own ways, we, um, we, we kind of trade on that for our own, I guess, like salvation or just trying to, to get a little bit away from what is what is harming us. Can you just talk to me about like, what, what are some of the examples that you can think of from the book that really help illustrate some of those challenges for folks? Yeah, I mean, so on a little bit more of a general level, I think, uh, you know, part, part of what I was dealing with for a really long time was the fact that whiteness meant acceptance to me. So, um, the idea was to, to get to sort of that standard myself and think mm -hmm. of my individual benefits from that standard without really looking and, and seeing how me, me trying to reach that ideal was harming other people. So for example, um, uh, there are lots of examples of this in the book, but, um, one of the examples in the first full chapter, which is called Southbound, um, I talk about um, not being invited to my city's uh, debutante ball. Um, mm. And it, this was after I graduated from high school. And um, I, I did very well in high school and I did all kinds of activities and I did a ton of volunteer work. And then uh, all of my friends, all of my close friends got an invitation to this debutante ball. Now I did not actually want to go to the ball and I didn't, and I did not plan on going to the ball, even if I was invited. I knew it was a racist institution. However, it really hurt my feelings when I didn't get an invitation. And ever since then, you know, I have unpacked what those feelings derived from, which is 
I thought I deserved to be invited. I thought that I was the kind of brown person who should get invited to mm. a roughly white event, right? I mean, it was kind of like a very internalized version of the model minority myth. But I did not realize that even my desire for that was harmful, right? It wasn't just harmful to me, but having a kind of goal that is so entrenched in white supremacy is really harmful to all of us. Um, so, I mean, that was an early lesson and it took me a few years to unpack it after that, uh, after that um, event because I, was, I really needed to be in a place where instead of me thinking of myself is, oh, I didn't get invited because I was brown. I really needed to think about the fact, I needed to think about why, why would I aspire to something like that? And why would I even be hurt because of something like that? It's because I thought I had played the game. I, I thought I had done all the right things and that I deserved it more than other brown or black people. Um, so that took, that took a few years for me to figure out, but I think that instance is a really sort of good analogy for what a lot of non-Black folks tend to do is we still kind of strive for, for whiteness. And I mean like institutional whiteness, not actual skin color. We still, right. we still strive for that. We still long for that. And what is that longing really based in? It, it is based in, in, in a kind of self-hatred, um, in a kind of betrayal um, of other folks who are far more marginalized than we are. Um, so, I mean, that, that is the sort of thing that I talk about in the book is, is where uh, I seemingly always know what is racist and what isn't racist. That's that's not that's never been an issue for me. I've always been very vocal, actually, from when I was a child in talking about racism and calling out racism um, and telling people they were racist. But there were there are layers to that. Like that's kind of the superficial work of dismantling white supremacy, but it really doesn't get into the deeper layers of why am I still playing the game, right? Why am I still trying to, why am I, why am I condemning white supremacy, but then conforming to it, right? Why, why am I still upholding the system e even as I, even as I complain about it or rage about it? Um, so that's, that's, I talk about that some in the book. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, you know, can you just talk to us about like, we, 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 we talk about that. That's what's like earlier on. And then we're, as we move on throughout the chapters, we move on throughout the book, and I think there's an evolution of sorts that seems to happen by the time we're towards the end. And you're talking about, you know, the issues that we saw in 2018 in terms of voter, excuse me, y'all, voter suppression, particularly some of the really egregious efforts we saw happening in Gwinnett County that directly impacted AAPI voters in particular. Um, and then, you know, ultimately you, you have a, you, your final chapter is identity as social change, right? So you're, you're going through, I mean, you're going through some, so can you talk to us a little bit about like that, that evolution and journey, right? And thought and getting from where it's like, I'm just trying to be seen. And as someone said in the chat, you know, feeling like I belong or a part of a larger community to, there is something valuable in being me and claiming this and owning my identity, leaning into who I am is actually a vehicle for change, for organizing and moving forward. Absolutely. I mean, I think we all have identities, no matter what they are, that have really shaped our lives in very positive ways. Um, and also very negative ways, um, per, you know, particularly if we are on the receiving end of some kind of bigotry or discrimination. Um, so early on, you know, I, I've been an activist for quite a while. I started in various, uh, I used to uh, do work um, to support communities who'd been on the receiving end of sexual violence and intimate partner violence. And then I kind of did a lot of work with respect to reproductive rights. Um, 
and uh, I worked in labor law. And so um, I don't think I was really reckoning with who I was and sort of capitalizing on the on what I could bring to the table because of my life experiences. I was just kind of doing the work and I was excited about the work and I was passionate about the work, but I wasn't, I wasn't asking myself, you know, there's something unique about me and there's something unique about all of us that can be more effective if I'm in doing certain other, certain kinds of work, right? Um, and part of that, which I didn't really realize until uh, after Trump was elected, was how few Asian Americans were coming to were, were voting. Right, the, the turnout mm -hmm. the turnout was dismal. Asian Americans have historically had some of the lowest voter turnout in the country, and so that fact that and I didn't know this until 2016 incidentally I actually had no idea what kind of voter turnout Asian Americans had um, when it came when it came to uh, elections so in 2016 obviously we were all in a bad place after Trump was elected I started really um, trying to understand what happened I wasn't totally surprised he was elected I was really afraid leading up to the election well, when he was, I was trying to do what most of us were doing was, was an autopsy of this election, right? And I started really asking myself, what didn't I do? And then I read a statistic somewhere about that it, the AAPI community historically had some of the lowest voter, or at the time it was like the lowest voter turnout. And I was stunned because I'm like, I'm Asian American, I'm South Asian, I'm Indian. I live in a suburb of uh, of Atlanta that has an enormous Asian American population. All of my neighbors are Asian American, right? Like 40% of my kids' public schools are Asian American. So I was like, wow, I could have done something to get people to the polls. This is where identity has really played a role for me because here I was doing other types of activism work that I was proud of, but probably not uh, other people could have done that work well, right? I could have been replaced by someone else who was compassionate and skilled in the same type of work, but where were the where where can I help the AAPI electorate in Georgia? How can I help them get to the polls? And that's when everything started shifting for me. And I started volunteering for the John Ossoff campaign when he was running um, for a Congress. And I, I volunteered under Representative Sam Park, who was gathering a whole bunch of Asian Americans and trying to inform a constituency of us to focus on getting out the vote in the Asian American community. Um, and it, and it took me a while to get to this point, but my overall point to everyone here is there's something unique and special about your identity. And there are things that you also have specific skill set for an expertise, a perspective. And it's fantastic if you can sort of merge the two to find the kind of work that will not only be really important to you, that make a really big difference in your community. And that's how I ended up getting involved in electoral politics because I saw a need um, of a certain community and I had not been involved in that particular way before. And I realized that Asian Americans who look at me, who see my name, maybe I would be able to talk to them more. Maybe they would listen to me when I talked about, um, you know, have you registered to vote? Have you had a chance to make it to the polls yet? What do you need? What do you need from me? What can I provide you? Um, and so that's really was the key for me, was, was me trying to think of, I have this identity that I'm proud of. I have this community that I'm proud of and that I love. What is something I can do for them that isn't quite happening as it should? That was a long. Mm. 
<laughs> but it was a good answer. Um, I mean, there was just so much there. I think for a lot of us, like we were very passionate about particular issues that maybe we weren't as directly involved and engaged. And if you did get kind of interested in 2016, definitely by the time we had the midterm election, particularly here in 2018, it really had that sense of urgency in a particular way. Um, and I think that between 2018 and 2020, especially here in Georgia, mm -hmm. it has fundamentally shifted, I think, the way a lot of us look at uh, electoral politics and engagement. I mean, I know that that's, you know, really critical for my own development as, you know, someone who covers politics from a, a particular lens. And so uh, thank you so much for sharing that perspective. Now, just thinking about, you know, we've been so hyper digital this past year mm -hmm. and obviously understandably because of the pandemic, but so much has happened, right? And the way it shifted the way in which we engage with people, the way we build community. So still, you know, I'm skipping around the book, folks. You definitely, it's going to be read it, enjoy it, devour it all, skip essays, whatever you need to do to, 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 to take it all in. But you talk a little bit about like moving to online, like the online armchair activism world, right? Mm -hmm. like the difference. Like you really lay out the clear difference between just being an armchair activist online, which I appreciate like it's not the term slacktivist because I think there is a over, people over underestimate, people underestimate the power of what can be done with online action, but you make sure to connect it to what's happening in the real world. Can you talk to us a little bit about the power and importance of building those communities and finding those collaborative spaces, but also connecting it to real world? And, and how does your understanding of that change now that we're a year into pandemic virtual life? Yeah, wow, that's such a big question. So, um, so I've learned so much this past year because of the pandemic. Um, first of all, I the online realm has really exploded and expanded activism spaces. Um, we, there are so many things that so many people can do now effectively online. And what's great about, um, if you have the internet, um, it is accessible to you, right? We, we, we don't have as many barriers as we do doing activism online as we do when we have to have people show up somewhere, which often involves, uh, you know, uh, working around a job, working around childcare, transportation, um, and other sorts of issues. Um, so what I think is an important thing to weigh in one's mind when we are doing work online, um, which can be anything at this point, it can be um, introducing people to events in the community. It can be um, sharing information about where you can go vote. Um, it can be uh, art news articles uh, about uh, issues affecting the community. It's important to, I think, to do that work, but get a sense of uh, your local organizers and the type of work they're doing and try to spend a good amount of your time online uplifting the work that they're doing. Um, so I think that's really important. Connect with local grassroots orgs that are working on the issues that you're interested in. You can connect with them completely online as well. You can sign up for their newsletters. Um, organizations have so many great online workshops now. So this is a lot of stuff that you can do to educate yourself if you want to get involved in, you know, more personal interactions with folks in your community to do the work that you want to do. Um, so that's one thing. You know, there are some risks. I think what, what happens that sometimes gets frustrating for me as an organizer, and I think for some other organizers too, they might feel this way, is that you'll get a lot of like, celebrity voices or influencer voices telling people people what to do online and they are like not even in your state they 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 don't do any sort of grassroots work and the issues that they're talking about 
And so what happens is, is they kind of drown out the voices of organizers who are experts in the field and who are trying so hard to mobilize people and also to protect the members of their own community, right? We sometimes see this like as an example, you know, like we had calls to boycott Georgia, right? To like literally boycott the entire state. Don't come here, don't come to our hotels, don't, don't visit your family here, don't spend any of your money at businesses in Georgia. You know, this is not helpful to people here and you're gonna end up harming the people most who, who need the most, who need those dollars, who own small businesses, who are working really hard in these communities. Um, and you also harm the, uh, the organizers. I mean, we need more support. We don't, we don't want less support. Um, so, I mean, that's the risk of, of online work is if you are really only sort of amplifying the platforms of um, famous people and not really sharing or retweeting or liking what the actual community members are, are posting about, um, what uh, leaders, community leaders are posting about, what uh, affected people in our population, what organizers are posting about. So I think that's where it gets a little, a little sticky and a little frustrating is, is when, you know, these sort of big calls to do something for your, uh, your, you know, your city or your county or your state from people who really don't even live here and don't really know what's going on. Um, but I do, I mean, if the, there is one good thing that, um, one good thing that came out of the pandemic, it, it is that we became so much better organizers online. I mean, I am not super confident with a lot of technical things, um, but, um, we were able to figure out ways to work around, for example, um, the elections, um, right? I mean, phone banking, you know, it used to be something people came to my house to do, right? We would order pizza. We would all sit with our cell phones in various corners of the room. Um, you know, uh, canvassing, we were still able to do. Um, we did a lot of text banking. Um, we did a lot of, uh, a, a lot of outreach through, um, through various apps. Um, so we did find ways to get the word out to people who needed it. Um, the toughest thing though, was that because we did not have really any in-person interaction, it was harder to have the joy that's a part of activism. There's a lot of laughter in this kind of work. There's a lot of hugging. There's a lot of joy. There's a lot of let's knock on the doors of a hundred houses and then go out to dinner afterwards. Right. Or, you know, let's have brunch at my bagels and coffee at my house before we go stuff campaign lit, uh, inside of, uh, newspapers, uh, by grocery stores. Right. I mean, the work of organizing can be so tedious and grueling, but it's often balanced with socialization, right. With, with meeting up with people, um, and, and with goofing off, right, and being silly. And, and that part was really, really hard because we didn't really have the opportunity to recharge uh, and nourish ourselves mm -hmm. in the first year. You know, Anoa, I was actually just thinking about this. You were one of the last people who lives outside of my household that I hugged before COVID. Because mm, we did that panel. We did that panel in Gwinnett County. Oh, I forgot. We and did that panel really, like a week or two. It was very, very like yes. right around. We cut it close. And I remember seeing you and like hesitating and not being sure whether I should hug you or not. Like this was, you know, I mean, COVID was around, but no one was wearing masks. It, it wasn't the shutdown yet. We had not shut everything down yet. It was like, yes. the, like it was in California. There may have been like one or two cases yes. possibly here, but we had not shut everything down yet. Yeah, I remember. And, and I and I missed that, right? And I think we did hug. Did we actually? We did hug. We did hug. Oh, yes, we did hug. <laughs> so <good>. Okay. <laughs> so we did actually hug. That's good. Uh, and I'm glad because obviously we have not hooked since. 
although we are vaccinated. So hopefully we will have that hug. Yes, soon. yes. But, but that, I mean, when I like see an organizer in person, that gives me so much energy to keep going, right? But like this last election, I mean, you know, the last few months before the election and you were covering it as a reporter. So I'm sure you also were not sleeping very much. Um, but right, none of us in Georgia were sleeping, you know, more than a few hours a night. We were all at the point where we, every single day, we felt like we would completely drop to our knees from exhaustion. But we didn't even get to like hang out with one another, right? I mean, you know, they see Blue Georgia started, our Georgia chapter started in August of 2019. And we had this great event with Stacey Abrams in February 2020. And then we started shutting down. So it's like, I still, like, there are a lot of members that I've not, like, seen in person. And that nurturing is so important for organizing work. It's so important. It's what, what keeps you going. It's like the caffeine, right, mm -hmm. that you drink when you wake up in the morning. You feel like you can't go on. I mean, when I see my folks, like... You know, when I see the progressive activists in Georgia who I have so much love and respect for and who have just guided and taught me and support supported me, you know, and I include you in that, Anoa, when I can't yes. see you all, I just it just really gets me down. So that's been really hard with the online activism. How has it been for you? Yeah, I, I appreciate that so much. And so thinking back to 2018, like when this is, I'm answering the question, right? But this is just an, this is something that stuck out to me. So we have had this whole election year mm -hmm. in quarantine. You know, we have local elections happening all over the country right now. Recently, Tashara Jones won the election to become St. Louis's first Black woman mayor. And one thing that stuck out to me when the night Tashara won was, Tashara was here on the ground in like May of 2018, knocking doors with a collective effort led by, you know, uh, the Glow Vote, which was a collaboration with New Georgia Project Action Fund and some other national and some national partners. And so they had this whole collective of black women just come in town. And Tashara, even as elected official from St. Louis, came with her sneakers, their little t-shirt on like everybody else. And but she's captured in this amazing documentary called And She Could Be Next. And like that, I remember that weekend, I wasn't, I wasn't around when they were out that, that day, but like earlier that weekend, we, I had been out with a different group knocking doors. We were down mm -hmm. in Clayton County, um, you know, knocking doors and helping to get folks out, you know? And so like remembering just that week of, of, of stuff, right. Remembering that camaraderie that was mm -hmm. built, remembering having election night watch parties with people, right? And then we're at this point now, and some people are starting to do stuff like that because people are socially distancing sure. outside or whatever they're doing, or, or now we're all getting vaccinated. So we'll see how things return. But it has been wild. Like there are people who I absolutely miss so deeply and dearly. Like there are people who I'm regularly in communication with. So I appreciate that analysis, you know, going through the difference between armchair activism. It was something that, because I do a class um, with uh, social justice law students um, about uh, you know digital organizing and social media comms for social justice lawyering, right? Um, and one of the things that I talk about is like how you know digital is is such a powerful tool, right? It doesn't replace online and offline engagement mm -hmm. in personal conversations and building. It is an asset in addition to. But for a good portion of our year, it did replace that, right? And so yes. people had to learn to still do authentic engagement and community building digitally. And that's just been amazing. And then just being someone who has worked remotely for about three years in total, fully. And even before that, I worked remotely part time when I was practicing. And so... But like, you know, covering and really engaging and building with people, it's been a fascinating experience. But I know you and I, in addition to the organizing, the digital parenting. <laughs> yes. Parenting growing teenage, almost adult humans into their full selves, right? You're talking a lot about identity. There are reflections from your own upbringing and child here. But like this past year of just all of these things, we're talking about inheritance, Right. What are we giving to our own children as we are co-parenting, leading them through 
a major crisis on multiple levels right now, right? We have the the rise in Asian American, not just Asian, not just Asian American, but AAP, API hate violence. We mm-hmm. saw what happened here in Atlanta, um, the metro area recently. I mean, we have, you know, police killings that haven't happened. They're just, just we're all home together. So mm-hmm. we're very much absorbing and consuming these things, right? Um, my daughter, I remember, a couple of weeks ago, like after the, 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 the killings happened, the spot killings happened, um, my daughter shared with me, she forwarded me an email from one of her professors that was explaining and putting historical and like proper political context of what had happened, why people should be concerned about it, whether they are from, they have an Asian background or not. Mm-hmm. And she, she was just so moved, right? She was like, I knew I liked my teacher. This is right. Like, th- this is what we need to be talking about. I just had to share this with you, mama. And I was like, oh, okay, well, you know, I like your teacher too. That's cool. But like, we have had, and, and, and we haven't necessarily always been able to gather and, and hold yes. said that hug. I do remember when we hugged because it was, it was in the primary. Um, yes. It was, it was, the COVID was starting to happen and it wasn't really clear what was going on. It wasn't really clear how people were going to handle things. I know there were a lot of concerns in terms of the way in which um, the prior, prior president was doing things. So we just had a lot. There was a lot of, you know, the blame China nonsense was yes. going on. There was just so much was happening, right? And we were, we were, we weren't just on a panel together. We were doing a conversation about voting rights. Yes. Right. Yes. And so ahead of a local election in Gwinnett County. And so it was really and it was a, it was low turnout because of what was going on in terms of the pandemic, you know, coming. But it was still so important that that was our, you know, that was actually our first time getting together in person. I think we yeah. had no friendship. We might have met once we, before we met that. Once before at some other yeah. event. Yeah, we met once before yeah. that. But like, we really developed our friendship in between those two points. Yes. That's the other yes. like positive. That's the other wild thing about digital organizing. Like, you have these amazing people you've been in the trenches with that you've really been building with that you're fighting for all these awesome things. With it's not just oh, I'm in. I mean. I'm not going to diss Facebook groups because Facebook groups are an amazing space and have so yeah. much potential and do dope work, right? Um, and whether they're mom groups, whether they're dad groups, family groups, whatever they are, whether they're political groups, whatever, whether you're just talking about General Hospital, my General Hospital Facebook group that I started when my grandma passed away, it really saved me <laughs> in 2000. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, it was just still such a, it was so powerful to, to, to see you in that moment. Yeah. Um, like it was Thank so just affirming to be there with you in that moment. And like, like now, even though we're virtual, um, you know, still like the, the, the way in which you, you build community is, is beautiful. And I feel like through the book, you're building community around these shared experiences that you're leading us through. And you touch on some things. Um, you mentioned Vincent Chin, um, in your opening, right? It, mm-hmm. Earlier on in the book, you you re- reflect on Vijay Chin, and that's that chapter you have is different in many ways from from the others, right? Yeah. Um, you, it it's it, it's it it breaks it breaks conventionality. Yeah. Can you you talk to us about the stylistic choice there with that chapter? Absolutely. So there is a story behind it. Um, I. So Vincent Chin was killed in Detroit, Michigan, when I was actually living uh, in a suburb of Detroit. So I think I was living with my family about 15 miles away from where he was killed. And I was eight years old. I was a couple months shy of turning nine years old. And I was just starting to really understand the concept of race. Um, You know, it wasn't anything. I had not really thought much about it. And um, because we were local, you know, Vincent Chin, his death made national news, of course, but it was also on our local news station for months afterwards because it was a local news story. So, you know, uh, back then in the old days, right, the, the news came on only in the evening and we would always have it on in our living room. And so I would be watching and paying attention and I would be seeing Asians protesting and marching. And then I would hear a little bit about, you know, the 
the charges filed against his killers and um, then hear about the fact that they were acquitted. Um, and this is when I first heard the, the term uh, hate crime um, because Vincent Shin was his, his, uh, death was the first time that the, that federal hate crime charges were filed on behalf of an Asian American. So I've been thinking about writing this essay for a really, really long time, but I couldn't figure out how to approach it. So I had taken a bunch of notes and I had sort of a little bit of an outline. And uh, uh, a dear friend of mine, Piali Bhattacharya, was living in Nashville, Tennessee at the time. She's also a wonderful writer. And she said, can you come to my house for the weekend? And I'm having just a really informal reading in my living room um, with you know, a, a few other South Asian writers. And I thought, oh, of course, I'll definitely uh, come see you. So I went up to her home and I said, look, there's really nothing that I have to read, but because I'm around such like brilliant writers, I would love to read sort of this outline I have for an essay that I haven't yet written. Um, and she she said, oh, okay, um, you know, that's fine. Just read whatever you want, no pressure. You know, it was a small, small group of people. So I decided to read what my outline was for the essay, which starts out in a chronology of Asian American history, but it's scrambled. So I don't have it like year after year. I have the years completely mixed up. Um, at the time, it was because I was being disorganized. But it ended up staying. And then the rest of the essay, which wasn't nearly finished, was sort of these vignettes, these like little paragraphs um, of, about events that were happening, not only following his death, but in my own personal understanding as a child of what race was and what it was uh, to be Asian and what it was to understand that people would target Asians. So that's what I read at this reading. And the people at the reading were like, and I, and I prefaced it, I was like, these are just kind of notes on an essay, but maybe if I read it to you, you can help me figure out where to go with it because I'm really stuck. And I read the essay and everyone was like, that's, keep the form, keep exactly that form you have. And I was like, okay, well, I mean, this is really just like me throwing a bunch of stuff on the page. But it, as it turned out, it really worked for the essay because so much of what happened to him and so much of the injustice doesn't make sense. And so what you see on the page is me not only trying to make sense about how this his family could get no justice, no compensation. His killers have not spent a single day in jail and they've not paid a single dime. And they're both living and alive somewhere in the United States. And it was me also trying to see his death in the context of Asian history. And so that, that ended up being the form of the essay. And once I got the confidence from this great group of writers to, to keep the form, suddenly I was able to figure out what needed to be in the essay and how to write it. But I, I needed that external validation to figure out how to tell the story because I just couldn't write it. I was, it was, it's probably the hardest essay I've ever written um, because there's a danger there, right? Like I didn't want this to be trauma porn. I didn't want to exploit the death in any way. Um, and there are certainly, you know, Asian American activism has a long history in the U.S. It precedes uh, his life and his death. Um, but for Gen Xer Asian Americans, right, I'm a Gen Xer, that mm -hmm. was a very key moment in our awakening um, when we saw this happen to somebody um, who had roots in the same continent who maybe had a family, uh, you know, who came from a family of immigrants who was an immigrant himself. Um, so this story really resonated with people. And um, for my generation, and perhaps for older than my generation, I think it was a wake-up call that 
you know, white supremacy does not really differentiate that much between Asians and native folks and Asians and black folks and Asians and Latinx folks or Arab folks or Jewish folks or Muslim folks. Like the problem at the heart of all of this is the same white supremacy that this nation was founded on. And we have got to stop um, aligning ourselves with it. We've got to reject the model minority myth, which has only ever been weaponized, not only against our own communities, but especially the black community. And we've got to build multiracial coalitions um, and raise our voices with every single death, um, you know, no matter if they're Asian or not. Um, so yeah, so that's how it came to be. It was probably one of the first essays I started for this book and was probably the very last. I mean, I worked on it through the, almost the whole course of the book until I had to turn the book in because it was really important for me to try to have a form that served the function that was kind of, you know, asking questions in the prose that were buried in here about how did we get here? Where do we go from now? And um, how do we remember him and remember his legacy and the fact that his family never received justice? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's powerful. Um, I think folks really, you know, forget or think that this can't be, you know, us or whatever the case may be mm -hmm. until it does happen. Um, yeah, and, and I mean, Asian Americans, we will never ever uh, survive until we confront our complicity, confront our anti-blackness. It's just mm -hmm. not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And, and we still have to work on it. We still have too many people who buy into white supremacy and, and we will not survive in this country. We will not survive in the world if we, if we do it. Uh, you know, I mean, every, every racialized injury we need to take every single one personally we need to grieve every single one to the same degree right it shouldn't matter whether it's an, uh, a black person or an indigenous person or a latinx person R really it's all the same um and i'm and i really hope that if there is anything to come of the horrific killings at the atlanta spas it is Asian Americans really coming, you know, becoming aware of the fact that the enemy has always been and will always be white supremacy. And we have to take care of not just our community, but all the communities that are being affected by, by white supremacy. It's everybody. We are all siblings. We, we need to build a multiracial, multi-ethnic coalition there are no answers in silos to this movement, right? There's no answers to just Asian Americans getting together and fighting it. It's got to be all of it. Um, and and we, we have to really reckon with our own internalized racism to do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and just thinking about just moving forward and takeaways, what do you hope people take away from the book. I know folks are waiting for their copies to come, but just some thoughts on like, just your hopes for folks. Um, I mean, we receive the art, how we receive it once it's put out into the world, but what just some of the, some of your thoughts? You know, that's an interesting question. Um, I've done a few interviews and people have asked me, um, who do you see as the audience of your book? Um, you know, what do you want people to take away? And it's interesting because when I start writing a book, and what I focus on in the book is, is it's, it's, it's very much about myself. It's very much about me trying to learn something, right? Mm. I, mean, I hope people find ways to build within their communities, to work at a local level, um, and figure out what they are passionate about and where they might be a good fit to get involved in work that is 
of a civil rights type of nature, whether it is fighting uh, violence within the community, gun violence, for example, whether it is fighting for voting rights, um, whether it is fighting, you know, to expand Medicaid, um, whether it is fighting um, unjust uh, immigration laws and policies, this work is not over. I mean, you know, I, I think there are people who, you know, once Biden won, kind of shut things down a little bit and, and went away. I mean, it's good to rest. I'm not saying don't rest. It's good to rest and take care of yourself in between big events. But <laughs> what happened after uh, Biden got Georgia's electoral votes and Georgia delivered two Democratic senators is that our Georgia legislator pa legislature passed a voting bill that will significantly disenfranchise all voters, but disproportionately disenfranchise black and brown voters. I mean, that's what happened, you know, with while Biden was president, right? This is year round work. This is work that has to be continually invested in. Um, you know, again, take breaks and take rest when you need it, but we can't really be gone for long. We've got to keep the momentum going. Um, and we've got to find time to both recharge, but still devote and dedicate ourselves to this work because it's never gonna be done. I mean, when I think about even what's happening later this year, right? I mean, we're gonna have redistricting um, this fall. Mm -hmm. And this will be the first time there will be redistricting since the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act in Shelby County v. Holder in 2013. This is a really scary thing to think about, right? I mean, this is, this needs to be a major movement of resistance uh, in, in, our, in our lives. And there's also gonna be local elections and we need to really yep. start thinking about, about um, we need to change our point of view on local elections. They are just as important as the presidential election. They always have been and they always will be. And this needs to be something that we are constantly talking to people about and educating voters about and talking about candidates that are running. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I bring up when I talk to folks about how important local elections are, I ask them uh, who affected them most during the pandemic. And, mm -hmm. and what, what they come to realize is that it was their city council members, it was their mayor, it was the school boards that decided yeah. to either do in-person or, or, uh, or online schooling. I mean, these, these local, these municipalities, um, these counties, they have the kind of power to change your daily life in a way that the federal government doesn't necessarily affect or even the state level government. So, um, you know, I, I hope people find the kind of work that nurtures them, the kind of work where they feel appreciated and loved. And um, I, I hope they I hope they find ways to do some type of civic engagement. And it doesn't have to be something as big as working on, you know, uh, a Senate election, right? You can do the smallest units of activism and they are so effective. You can just start by attending your city council meetings, right? On a regular basis and making public comments at city council meetings. You can start by joining your local NAACP chapter if you're not sure where to start. That's a great place to start. Um, you know, you can join the Georgia Muslim Voter Project or support Russia, um, no matter what your abilities, um, you know, no matter what your resources, there is very likely some kind of work that you can do. Um, and I hope Southbound 
um, helps inspire people to find something that's a really good fit for them. Um, because the more, the better fit for you means you will likely do the work long term, that you won't burn out, that you might find people that you have something in common with and can connect with. Um, so I, I hope it's a little bit of a call to action, maybe. Perhaps that's being too presumptuous, but I hope it is a little bit of a call to action. Absolutely. Absolutely. We did have one question as a wrapping up. Um, how did you know the book, given the current sociopolitical climate and how much is going on right now, and then the wealth of inspiration, how did you know when your book was finished? And again, like so much is happening right now, mm -hmm. it's not quite happening when you were writing the book in the right. same way, right. but there's still a lot going on. So how did you know you were done, that you had the book that you were going to publish, at least in terms of this collection? That's a great question. Um, so yeah, so first of all, it was a little, it was a little hard to turn in a book like before the presidential election, right? Because I felt like so much was going on and Georgia was really the center of the universe in a lot of ways um, for, for the presidential election, but especially for the runoff election, right? All eyes were on Georgia. Um, and I was doing a lot for the election, like many of us were. I mean, many of us totally uh, rearranged our lives to volunteer. Um, so um, I, I found myself feeling a little uh, anxious about the fact that some of these big events were not going to be included in the book. And then a friend of mine said something that really sort of changed my view about that. She said, um, you know, every book is really just a snapshot of the moment that it's in. And you have to you have to think about your book not really in the moment that it comes out, right? Not really think of it as like, oh, April 15th, it's in the world. But think of it as a little bit of a anthropologist, right? Or a, a historian picking up the book 10 years from now and what might they learn from it 10 years from now? And when she said that, that really gave me a better perspective. And then the essays that I felt like, you know, that might change so much after the presidential election, I felt I felt better about completing them. I, I realized that, you know what, this, this essay about the, the midterm election, it's a snapshot shot of what was happening in Georgia and the Asian American community in 2018. That's what it is. Yes, we might do something completely different in 2020, but this is what it is for now. Um, I had, you know, I had an essay on, you know, the, the armed for activism, as you mentioned, right? It was mainly written before COVID um, and the book was due. And so I did my, I, I made a reference to COVID, but I couldn't really at that point change the structure of the book and like write a whole new essay or add several pages to it. But it, it's a snapshot in the moment. And when I when I heard that wisdom from my friend, I was like, OK, I can walk away from these essays now. I can walk away from this book knowing that the reader, readers are super smart, they understand, will, will view the book as a snapshot of certain points of time and that the book will still hold up, you know, even if Trump gets reelected or even if, uh, uh, you know, we don't flip the Senate, um, or even if we do, it, it will still hold up because it's meant to be a commentary of specific times. Um, and, and that's, you know, and, and that's when I finally realized, okay, I think I can put this down and, and, and walk away from it and feel good about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Y'all, this has been like so good. I appreciate the conversation. I appreciate the community, the camaraderie, the, the, the excitement in the chat has been amazing to enjoy. Uh, everyone's getting their copy of Southbound, yes. And folks who have already ordered it, have it coming in the mail. And when you get it, just like we post the peach or if you post, but if you're not in Georgia, you're someplace else, you post, you know, whatever you vote when you vote. Post your picture southbound. If you don't want to pose with it, that's totally fine. I understand. I don't always want to take pictures either. 
but post your copy of Southbound, you know, share it, make sure other people know and share the replay of this will still be available. So share the link so other folks can have the conversation and get to listen to the author herself. Anjali, it's been amazing talking with you. It's been I, so I just, great. So... Thank you so much for everyone to co for coming. I really appreciate it. Please, if you are able to support your local independent bookstore, they have been through. <laughs> the indie bookstores have also been through a pandemic. They could really support, use the support. Please buy from Karis or your neighborhood bookstore or bookshop.org. Um, you know, it's so important for us to support these businesses. Um, they they hold our community's history, um, and they are the places where are there are homes away from homes, right? Um, and sometimes soon, hopefully, we will all be shopping more in bookstores again and attending author events in bookstores. So please, please, please think about your independent bookstores. Um, many of them ship to your home or you can pick them up outside of the store. So um, think, of, think of them. And another big thank you um, to E.R. Anderson for putting this together and Anoa, my dear, dear friend and comrade and colleague and all kinds of other things. Uh, thank you so much for your support, especially the past, the past year I couldn't have gotten through this without your friendship. Thank you for Georgia Muslim Voter Project who has done outstanding work. I am in awe. And as always, Raksha, who um, has been such a big supporter of the South Asian community for a really, really long time. Yes. Um, well, that, that those are really all of my thank yous as well. So uh, I will just say thank you to you both. I will remind folks that if you click this teal button, you'll be able to buy Southbound. Um, as well as uh, pre-order the new novel, which comes out in two or like oh, just about two weeks. Yeah, um, we. I got uh, that one too. Hey, you're ahead of the game. Um, we are primarily individually donor supported uh, in our nonprofit, so it does help us. Um, Five dollars, ten dollars, anything you're able to give really does support this work and pay for this platform and make sure that we can focus on the writers that we really believe in. So if you have that extra extra few dollars to give, it really does make a difference for us. Um, and again, thank you to Raksha and the um, Georgia Muslim Voter Project. We are very grateful for all the work y'all are doing mm -hmm. in our communities to make them better and safer. So um, the last thing I'll say is I'm gonna be adding captions to this and putting it up on our YouTube video uh, channel tomorrow. Um, so if you, you'll get an email at whatever address you registered for this event at. And um, if you'll share that um, link when it comes out because that's more accessible, that's great. You can also share this one right now. If you're like, I need to share it because I need people to watch this right now. Um, we want you to do that. But you can also share the more accessible one when it is available tomorrow. So thank you all. I hope everybody stays safe and well. And we can't wait to gather in person again. <laughs>